Hello! Greetings, planet Earth. Thank you so much for being here today. We are going to start in about two minutes. So I've got some, I've got some housekeeping stuff I get to do here. Uh, while we're waiting for everyone to join, uh, I've got to thank our visionary donors for making this event and other Let's Talk Science programming possible. And it's all amazing stuff. I love Let's Talk Science. I'm so excited about this. So huge thanks to Amgen Canada, to the Government of Canada, to Hypernia, to the Mitchell and Catherine Baran Family Foundation, Rio Tinto, and the Trottier Family Foundation. Thank you so much for making all of this possible. Um, there is some, we've got buttons to talk about. There's always, always fun buttons to play with. Uh, there is the chat button. So we'll post messages to you here, but you cannot send messages in return because they don't trust us. Uh, to ask questions to the panelists, uh, to ask for tech support, or to share your comments, please use the special Q&A button. So many buttons. It's like Stargate all over again. Our wonderful event team is here to help, and our panelists would love to hear from you, myself included. Uh, don't forget to turn on closed captioning, which is a brilliant addition, I must say. So that's on or off using the CNC, the CC button. And you can also send us your reactions using the reaction button. So before we begin, my friend Conan has a trivia question for you. The answer will pop up on screen in 25 seconds after I ask this. So the question is, from where did scientists extract dinosaur DNA in Jurassic Park? A, ancient tree sap. B, dinosaur bone. C, dinosaur egg. Or D, fossilized mosquito. Give that a little think. Here we go. And the answer is, according to that sound, I'm assuming, the answer is fossilized mosquitoes. And if you got that right, give us a thumbs up. Emoji us, let us know. In the movie, the scientists clone dinosaurs by extracting prehistoric blood from mosquitoes, because even the dinosaurs were troubled by them. Fossilized in amber, it's that beautiful medallion thing that he had. Um, there's mosquitoes, the mosquitoes become trapped in tree sap, which eventually hardens into amber over time. However, oh, reality, DNA is actually very fragile and decays rapidly. So making it unlikely that the DNA was gonna survive for millions of years. Therefore, while this concept is fascinating and led to many books and, and dreams, it remains in the realm of science fiction rather than real life science for now. We'll see. They're working on it. I read something about mammals, about uh, mammoths recently, which is kind of cool. They're doing the same kind of thing with that. Um, so hello, everyone, and welcome to Let's Talk Science Fiction, one of my favorite areas of chatter. My name is David Hewlett, and as a huge fan of both science and science fiction, I am very excited to be your moderator for today's event. It sounds very important. I'm assuming they're going to send me like a badge or something at some point. Uh, throughout the years, science fiction writers have inspired many many, many real life technological advances from things as common as our cell phones to the internet and more advanced technologies ranging from genetic engineering. Oh, we're getting to some of that today and artificial intelligence, which I'm sure we'll talk about today as well. And I mean, basically, those are two of the hottest topics right now anyway. So very much looking forward to that. Um, today, we will explore the fascinating world of science fiction and learn more about the development of innovative technologies that significantly change our world. We're looking into the future today, so we'll also discover some exciting career options in STEM, because if you don't know they're out there, you don't know you want to be them. Uh, so we need to find out how you can contribute yourself to our future through innovation. So, so keep your ears open for that. Um, let's get ready for a sci-fi journey. Thank you to our event partners, ArcticNet, the Canadian Space Agency, Genome Canada, Let's Talk Science, of course. I'm wearing their t-shirt right now, see? The Royal Society of Canada and the Stem Cell Network, all of which I've been researching, I might say, for bringing us all together from across the country. Thank you so much for that. Now, I checked on all of the pronunciation on this, so I really hope I get this right. Today, I am joining you from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. Boy, I got it. I think I got it. Um, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. I'm also aware that, that many of you are tuning in from various regions across Canada, which are traditional ancestral and unceded territories of numerous First Nations that carry 
thousands of years of wonderfully profound history. And it's really important for us to recognize and, and honor that stewardship of the indigenous peoples who remain the original inhabitants of these lands. And I encourage you to visit native-land.ca, which I did amazing, beautiful maps that they have there. And you can learn all about the traditional territories you're located on and uh, and research the many STEM contributions of indigenous peoples, because, you know, believe it or not, it's not all old white guys doing this stuff. Um, so do check that out. It is a, it's a wonderful site. I actually looked at it the other night. So um, if you want to post your thoughts on today's symposium on social media, please tag at Let's Talk Science on Facebook or Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it at Let's Talk Science underscore HQ on Instagram. Um, where we go? Interactive polls. Ooh, 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 here we go. Yes, you get to get some feedback on this. So today we are using Poll EV and you will need to use a personal device. You need to submit to submit your answer. You can go to pollev.com forward slash LTS 2017 and you follow the prompts. You can also text LTS 2017 to 37607 and text in your response that way. So why don't we do a test? Let's do a test. We are in testing phase. What is your favorite science fiction? It could be from any novel. It could be from a comic, TV, movie. You don't have to say Stargate, but you know, you might want to. And let's see how we, uh, how we do on that. We're going to wait and see how our, how, our, how our poll is working here. This is fun. I like the, I like the interactive nature of this. This is my mom will be able to at least get a couple of polls in there. Sort of ask, you know, um, how are we doing for responses? I am trying to see the screen, but I don't see it. Here we go. Oh, have we got it? Is it Star Wars? Is the Star Wars the right one? Did I get that right? Favorite science fiction is Star Wars. Good choice. I think that's right. Star Wars, I remember it well. I thought I was gonna be Han Solo. I ended up being C-3PO. I really thought I was gonna be, you know, much braver than I am. Uh, okay, so we've done our first poll. I am gonna scroll on down here. Um, I have another question for you. Have you ever been inspired or influenced by science fiction? Because we were talking about science fiction today and it's just interesting to see how, where people from, come from this stuff. So the, the next question is, have you been inspired by science fiction? But nice to know who's coming from that angle and who's not. So we've got a couple of wonderful guests today and and one is a non sci fi One is definitely a sci fi and I, of course, fall into the sci-fi category. So curious to know who else is, who's with me? That's what I want to know. Oh, yes and maybe. Look at that. Okay, so we've got, we definitely got a good chunk of yes. Um, and a, and a, and a, and a 38, so 63% are yes and 38% maybe. Interesting. Okay, so there you go. That is not as different as I thought. I thought there was going to be, it's funny, I thought there was going to be a bigger difference, but that's great. Okay, so, all uh, right, I'm having fun with my windows. And here we go. So today, you'll be hearing short talks from Derek and Maria, fantastic people, phenomenal scientists that I will introduce you to in a moment. We will also be having James the Hacksmith Hobson join us. I'm so happy. The poor guy is like flying in as we speak and we're throwing him straight on the microphone. So uh, really looking forward to having him him come and chat about sort of the uh, his, his sort of real world side of this stuff. And uh, you'll probably recognize him, I'm sure. He'll be joining us later for the panel discussion. So please do submit your questions to our speakers in the Q&A, that button I told you about as they come to mind. And we'll address as many questions as we possibly can during our panel discussion. So get them in there now. If you've got questions for James or anyone, please feel free to dive in on there. And now I have been asked to speak about myself. So we'll ask the fabulously talented Maxine to pull up my first photo, if you'd be so kind. Oh, look at that. God, you're good. So good. Uh, I have the uh, the fortunate, uh, fortunate uh, 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 a history of playing Dr. Rodney McKay on Stargate Atlantis and a few other a few other Stargates as well while I was in there. Uh, this is I've sort of found a, a weird position in the world where I, I pretend to be brilliant on television. As a result, I get to meet all of these wonderfully brilliant people. And perhaps that's the way I've orchestrated it now. I've used my own false brilliance to get to meet all of these wonderful, brilliant people who are actually doing stuff in the world. And it's just been an absolute inspiration for me. It's how I ran into 
the wonderful Bonnie Schmidt and how I got involved in Let's Talk Science and got obsessed with all, all that wonderful learning side of stuff. Uh, when, my, when I first started, uh, when my son was first born and, and he had to explain what his father did for a living, he said that his father works with monkeys because I was doing Rise of the Planet of the Apes at the time. And I, he just, that's, he could only, he just pictured me going to work with monkeys on a regular basis. But this was yet another one of my acting gigs that played into the science that I love as well. There's all this genetic engineering aspect to this stuff. Uh, uh, Stargate Atlantis was wonderful for introducing me to all sorts of different areas about space exploration and, and uh, various different sciences that I, that I ended up getting to look into. And as a result, I've met a lot of people who actually do this stuff. So he's not entirely wrong. I do, I do, I have, I've definitely worked, uh, it definitely feels like I'm working with monkeys sometimes and I'm often one of them. But um, it, but for the most part, I, I have this uh, I have this this privileged role of playing playing geniuses on on film and television. What I've tried to do is show people that there are new and different routes into learning. I am a high school dropout who plays geniuses on television. I've always loved learning. I have pursued it passionately all of my life, and um, and I feel very fortunate that science fiction has allowed me to to bridge to bridge those two worlds. I run a a, a website called techbandits.org, which I invite you to to check out, um, and uh, and I'll uh, I'll throw up a, a, a slide of that in a second. Let's bring up the second slide, uh, just to give you a uh, thank you, Maxine. This is these are the kind of wonderful people I get to meet while I'm doing what I do. So the beautiful thing about science fiction is that sometimes you get to bridge that to the real world. So here is myself with the the very talented uh, Jewel State, and also Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye. So this is the kind of connection that I suddenly realized while I was doing Stargate could be so much more than just an acting opportunity. And it has allowed me to pick these people's brains to find out how they work and, and in many cases befriend them. I mean, um, you know, Bill and I met at a, at a Let's Talk Science event. Well, I think the, the first time I actually ran into to Bonnie was, was, was at that. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Maxine. Uh, this is the kind of hard work that I do on set. This is Jason Momoa. You may know him from things like Aquaman. Uh, we did the series together for, for a long, many, many years. And uh, he was generous enough to get me onto his show C, where once again, we explored a future where viruses and genetic uh, modifications had led to, to more disastrous effects. If we could pull up the next slide, please, Maxine. Um, uh, what I've discovered in my travels as a science fiction actor is that we have a lot of responsibility for messing this stuff up. Because as you will see from this slide, all I've really learned from the science fiction was that it that, that genetic engineering tends to mess up your face and your eyes. This is uh, you get glowing eyes, you get weird glossy eyes, and you get um, uh, and you get these weird sort of cracked cracked. Um, uh, retinas and stuff that uh, that uh, that get to show up on screen so there's science fiction has a lot to answer for and i'm really looking forward to hearing derek's perspective on this where we get it wrong all the time i feel like i almost need to apologize for the science fiction so one of the things i am also trying to do in my in my travels is to is to maybe set some of this stuff right so if i could go to the last slide please thank you maxine uh this is what i'm up to right now techbandits.org as i say please you know feel free to check it out come um, see what we're up to i'm working on a thing right now called uh, escape room puzzle learning at the university of toronto with uh, arthia shook and um uh, and uh, Andrew Mason. And what we're doing is trying to come up with new ways of learning and teaching and, and getting kids engaged. And we just feel that this puzzle learning is a great way to tap into the whole gaming and stuff that, that, that kids like to do. Uh, and of course, I have the email of awesome awesomeness. If you want some, 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 some curiosity catalysts, some science and tech stuff that I found interesting for the week, then I, I invite you to check that out as well. But let's get into the good stuff. Let's get... Um, uh, let's get our first guest up here. Thank you very much, Maxine. Uh, so first, I am happy to introduce Derek So. Uh, Derek is a PhD candidate at the Center for Genomics and Policy at uh, McGill University's Department of Human Genetics, originally from Vancouver. Yay, Vancouver. That's where we shot Stargate. Uh, he first came to McGill for his undergraduate degree in biology and English literature. His doctoral project examines the bioethical debate around genetically modified humans and how stakeholders are, uh, how stakeholders' arguments are shaped by the way they imagine 
hypothetical people. Um, Derek is also interested in the ways that science fiction writers and theologians imagine the creation of future people and what bioethics can learn from those narratives. His presentation will look at CRISPR, genome editing in human embryos, and the influence of science fiction on genetic modifications. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Derek, thank you for joining us today. I cannot wait. Thank you, Dave, for the great introduction. Um, I'm going to uh, start. All right, here we go. Uh, my name is Derek, and today I'll be talking about the fascinating technology of genome editing and how the debate over changing human embryos is affected by science fiction. If you've learned before about genome editing, you've probably heard of the type called CRISPR, which is an acronym for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats, but that's not so important right now. Unusual genetic sequences called CRISPR were first discovered back in 1987, but it wasn't until the late 2000s scientists figured out that they were part of the immune system in microorganisms. Basically, bacteria can retain samples of virus DNA. When they're infected by the same virus in the future, they can make a copy of the sample that matches onto the invader's DNA and brings along a protein called Cas that can cut the DNA from the virus and prevent the infection. What Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier discovered in 2012 was how to create a new thing called a guide RNA that directs the cutting protein to whatever DNA you choose. If you then give the cell a DNA template that matches the section that you just broke and cut, it will copy that sequence in to fix the gap, along with whatever changes you inserted while making the template. This lets you basically change the cell's DNA at the specific location that you wanted to insert the new template. Variations of this technology have also been developed that can swap in and out individual letters in the genome, turn genes on and off, or even glow to show the location of the genes that you targeted instead of cutting it. Shortly after CRISPR was developed, scientists began using it in human embryos, uh, which consist of the first few cells that develop after fertilizing an egg with a sperm. Some of these experiments involved removing genes from donated embryos to see what role they were playing in development and to understand fertility better. Other groups tried to figure out if we could use genome editing on embryos from parents with a mutation that causes a genetic disease in order to let those parents have healthy children, or even to add a mutation that can make people resistant to HIV infection. These experiments uncovered a number of safety risks caused by CRISPR cutting DNA in the wrong place, making the wrong kind of change, or changing DNA in some of the embryo cells, but not in others. Scientists have also been developing new forms of CRISPR that hopefully try and reduce these errors. Now, for our first poll, I'm gonna ask you to answer a series of three questions about potential uses of genome editing in human embryos and whether you think they should be unacceptable or acceptable. Question one is to prevent the resulting child from having a life-threatening genetic disease. I guess we will give it uh, 10 or 15 seconds in order to see if there are any uh, dissenting opinions. All right, I think we'll move on to question two. Question two is to give the child resistance to an infectious disease. Interesting, some more, some more diversity in our responses. A lot of not sures. All right, I think it's uh, stabilized. So maybe we'll move on to question three. Question three is genome editing in a human embryo to give the child a higher IQ. I guess we'll give it uh, five more seconds in order to see if anyone uh, is still figuring out what they want to say. All 
All right, 25% acceptable and 63% unacceptable. Uh, we'll come back to these answers in uh, a few minutes. So for now, we're going to move on to the next slide. So as you may have heard, the first actual experiment to create genetically modified children was revealed in 2018. A Chinese scientist named He Jiankui recruited couples with an HIV positive father and offered to modify their embryos to be resistant to HIV, hoping to cut the CCR5 gene that the HIV virus normally uses to get inside the cell. Although he thought that this news would be celebrated as a breakthrough, he was strongly criticized by Western and Chinese scientists and ethicists um, for problems with the experiment. They pointed out that there are already ways to prevent inherited HIV infections without using a risky new technology, uh, that the experiment caused cuts to the children's DNA at the wrong locations, and that the parents had not been properly told of these issues and risks. The Chinese government eventually put He Jiankui on trial and sentenced him to prison. China also changed their regulations in order to make it very difficult for other scientists to make genetically modified children. As you can see from this map, most countries prohibit these kinds of experiments now, including Canada. Canada's laws call for a $500,000 fine or 10 years in jail for genetically modifying an embryo. In a 2019 survey, most Canadians said that they agreed with this law. The survey also asked Canadians whether they thought genome editing with different goals would be acceptable or unacceptable, uh, including the questions I asked you in the previous poll. Um, so you said 100% of respondents uh, to the poll that we just did said that it would be um, acceptable to use it to cure a life-threatening genetic disease, and 73% uh, of Canadians in this poll agreed. Um, in the poll uh, that we just did, 22% said that it was acceptable to give the child um, immunity or resistance to a non-genetic infectious disease, um, which is similar to the question that they asked, in which 51% said that it would be acceptable. And in our poll, 33% or sorry, 25% um, said that it would be acceptable to give a child a higher IQ, um, which is sort of close to the, the number that the Canada wide poll found with 17% saying that that would be acceptable. Uh, so as you can see, people's values depend a lot on which characteristics scientists or parents want to change in their future children. Bioethicists who debate whether we should change the genes of future people usually focus less on details like specific genetic changes or on future people's social roles than on a fairly small set of abstract characteristics like the ones shown in this slide. Some of these do not have very well understood biology, meaning that they're discussed not so much because they're scientifically realistic at the moment, but because they are culturally familiar to us from things like science fiction stories which lead us to imagine genetically modified people in very specific and sometimes stereotypical ways. In a paper published the same year as he revealed his experiment, He Jiankui actually criticized media comparisons between genome editing and science fiction novels like Aldous Huxley's dystopian Brave New World, saying that they, snow they stoked unnecessary fears. However, David Baltimore, the Nobel winning scientist who chaired the summit where He Jiankui revealed the genetically modified children, began his opening address by citing Brave New World and suggesting that it served as a valuable warning about real issues raised by gen genome editing. And uh, here we see there uh, the quotes from those. Um, uh, all right, uh, moving ahead. It's clear that the debate over human genome editing is shaped by stories from science fiction, which means that it depends a lot on which books and movies are referenced by journalists, academics, or politicians. Although there are hundreds of options, only a small number of these are regularly cited in ethics articles about genome editing. Brave New World is by far the most frequent, father followed in descending order by Frankenstein, the 1997 film Gattaca, which is pretty impressive given that it, uh, came out only 25 years ago, a 1984 Blade Runner, Star Trek, Olaf Stapledon's novel, The Last and First Men, which follows human evolution billions of years into the future, H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, and Ira Levin's Nazi cloning thriller, The Boys from Brazil. In the final part of this presentation, I want to compare some potential pros and cons of using science fiction references to explore the ethics of human genome editing. 
one potential advantage is that science fiction is exciting to talk about and can help bring in interest and make issues understandable to the public. Popular books and movies can be used as a sort of cultural shorthand to help communicate concerns like society dividing into different groups based on access to genome editing. A potential downside of using H uh, sci-fi uh, sci to communicate is that this can exclude people who are not familiar with the source material. Sci-fi references can also inhibit communication if they do not connect very well to the ethics issues or if people do not agree on which themes they represent. A benefit of using science fiction is that many sci-fi authors have developed detailed and well-researched worlds that can help us to imagine how things might change in the future. However, academics who use science fiction references to describe genome editing often omit these details and simply use these books and movies to illustrate a theme rather than closely analyzing what happens in the book. Science fiction narratives can help us to imagine ourselves in the shoes of future people and consider issues from their perspectives. Because sci-fi often centers around children and members of marginalized groups, it could help us to consider what it might be like growing up as a genetically modified person. This advantage, however, could be limited by the fact that science fiction stories sometimes rely more on plot than character development, and stereotypical characters could actually reduce our ability to imagine future people with creativity. Science fiction is often described as a way of looking at the present with a new lens and understanding how science and technology shape history. This means that it can help us to see how many possible futures could result based on how we regulate genome editing in the present. However, some authors claim that relying on science fiction makes futuristic stories seem like real scenarios or accurate predictions. This could lead us to overreact to highly unlikely scenarios and even distract us from considering, from considering issues based on the experiences of real people in the present. Lastly, science fiction often shows how science and technology are deeply associated with ethical issues and changes in the way that we see the world. And this can lead us toward a critical perspective rather than simply blindly adopting new technologies. However, some science fiction can also make technological changes seem like the most important influence on history and lead us to overlook social influences. Science fiction also tends to focus more on the experiences of scientists and the value of scientific insights than in any other profession, which could lead us to underestimate the importance of other groups. Um, so in the full, that concludes the presentation. Um, I worry you're going to ask the question, do you think that comparing human genome editing to science fiction books and movies is more helpful or more harmful when debating the ethics of this new technology? So far, there's a large majority for slightly more helpful, 25% saying much more helpful, and someone changed their vote from slightly more harmful to helpful, which is uh, quite interesting. It seems like there's a, uh, a strong consensus among the viewers so far that it's more helpful than harmful. All right, I think this is uh, stabilized. So that's the end of my presentation. Oh, we're up to 40% and 45% saying much more helpful. Thank you very much for uh, watching and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Derek, that was fantastic. I, I just, I love the way you're tying what's happening in the real world with the science fiction side of stuff. It just, it links it together so well. And I just, this like, oh my God, it's a million things I wanna talk about. Uh, fantastic, thank you so much um, for that. Um, and again, remember you can obviously continue to ask questions to the Q&A box. We'll answer them during our panel discussion. Next up, please welcome Maria Abu Chakra. Maria is a senior research associate at the University of Toronto. She is a theoretical biologist who specializes in studying complex biological phenomena. Maria's expertise lies in developing mathematical and computational models in various fields, such as evolutionary biology, behavioral ecology, and cell development, just a few things. During her graduate degree, she created a mathematical model that predicted the growth and form of sea urchin skeletons. Currently, Maria is applying her expertise to cell development and has produced a 3D model that can explore and predict how cells diversify to develop tissues. Today, she will talk about a scientific initiative very cool one called virtual human development where scientists from around the world are working together to improve our understanding of development and disease treatment and i cannot wait to hear this maria take it away thank you dave i don't even have to say anything you <laughs>
everyone about me. Um, and thank you all for joining. I want to thank the Let's Talk Science uh, and Stem Cell Network for the opportunity to talk today. So um, next slide. I want to talk to you about um, a really nice initiative. And this is where the science fiction and future comes in. Um, this is an initiative that is co-founded by Nika Shakiba, who's a bioengineer at UBC. And Nika has the ability to take and coerce any stem cell to, to do whatever she wants in a dish. It's pretty amazing stuff. And uh, Nozomo Yachi, who is a systems bioengineer. And Nozomo um, is trying to create little tiny um, cameras to put in cells so we can watch and see what they do. And myself, who is a theoretical biologist. But before I start uh, talking about uh, this initiative, I thought I'll explain what's a theoretical biologist. So next. So uh, a theoretical biologist basically is a scientist. And uh, <laughs> my tools are a powerful computer and uh, some programming languages. And I use these programming languages to instruct the computer to do what I needed to do. So officially, I'm a biologist by training. I did my undergrad and PhD all in biology. And I did this at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. And um, uh, other than taking a lot of biology courses and some few electives, I did not take any computer science. So I started learning programming when I was 13 and I just kept it as my hobby, which um, I think came, became valuable for me as a skill as a, when I started my PhD. And this is where I started to apply my programming skills and everything I learned in in biology for to try to um, model the sea urchin skeleton. And basically I was trying to figure out how did they form? Why are they circular? I mean, here I can show you some sea urchins. They look globular, but there's also sand dollars and they're the flatter versions. And I wanted to understand how do we, um, how can we create these globular versus flat shapes? And to do this, I had to learn geometry and physics, physics about soap bubbles, and I use those to create models that can predict the shape of the sea urchin. So that was my PhD. And um, what's important about modeling is that um, we can use math and physics and a lot of phenomena to capture biology. And these rules are described by code. So when I graduated, I uh, was hired at the Max Planck Institute in Plune, and that's where I learned evolutionary game theory, which is another framework that you can use to predict behavior. And I used it to understand how we will behave or how should we behave in this climate change um, system? What, how should we act? Should we delay? Should we act early? Or should we do nothing? And um, now I am working at the University of Toronto with Gary Bader, and I'm trying to understand how cells make decisions and how do they create the right numbers of cells? How do they know how many brain cells do we need or heart cells? And uh, for that, I developed a platform and that helps me explore what our cells are doing and try to ask questions. So this was just my journey and how I became a theoretical biologist. I wasn't a theoretical biologist from the start. This is sort of uh, built. And then uh, next, I thought I'd uh, talk to you a little bit about some of the advice that uh, I think makes, uh, that are important for science. Um, so I just said, I had a journey. My journey is not necessarily typical and there are many ways um, to have a scientific path. And so I, I want you to really, here, let me see if I can show. So really keep an open mind that just because your path is um, different than another doesn't mean you're less of a scientist or that it's not going the right way. Really have fun in the journey and make it your own. Um, the other thing I think uh, Derek talked about whether you'd want uh, to use CRISPR to give your child a better IQ. To be honest, I don't think IQs are a very good uh, way to be a scientist. I think uh, grit and passion are really, really important uh, for science. So um, so please uh, be passionate, curious, ask questions, because really that's the way um, science works. So grades cannot tell you that you have grit and they cannot tell you you have passion. So work hard and believe in yourself. Um, the other one is failure. Don't worry about failure. Doesn't mean you should stop being a scientist. It just means come up with a new plan, learn from your mistakes or whatever the failure is and see what next is. Um, Another point that I learned is you should read and read and read a lot more because really knowledge is the first step in any research project. You have to learn what others have done. We um, Science is built on the shoulders of giants. There's other science that came before me and I'm just building 
um, and moving forward from what they've done. So if you don't know what others have done, it's hard to know what the open questions are. And so really stay curious, have fun, and really just give yourself time to think and come up with new ideas. So next, I will actually go into our, <laughs> what is this virtual human about and what are we doing? Um, so I want you to imagine a scenario where you're sick. In this case, I'm sick. And what, it, what would I do? I would call the doctor. Um, I might say, hey, Siri, call Dr. X. Oh, sorry, Siri wow. actually called. No, 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 don't call doctor. <laughs> sorry. Okay, we're not calling. We're not asking her. Okay, so, <laughs> so we're going to use our phone to call Dr. X. And so Dr. X is going to answer and say, hey, Maria, what's up? And I'll be like, I'm sick. And he's like, okay, but it's just a cold. And I'll be like, no, next. I actually have a heading and I feel like it's going to explode. And uh, so at some point in the future, maybe all I have to do is put this little device on my head and I start scanning it. And he's like, okay, let me see what happens. And next. So he might uh, realize that, uh, hey, there's actually something uh, weird going on with your head. You have a lot of stuff in that head of yours. So maybe we do need to have a treatment. It's not just a cold. So. I haven't even stepped into an office right now, right? So all this is done over the phone. So what can Dr. X do next? So he might take this information that he got from the scan from my head and see, okay, she has a big fat mess. What should we do to fix this mess in her head? And so he might have treatment A or treatment B. And he can use models to try to predict which one's gonna be the better one for me before I even uh, try them. And so next. So once he figures out which one is the best, then they can take the next steps to test them or let me use them and see if that's going to help me. So this is sort of like the big picture. How can models or theoretical systems help us um, move um, medicine forward? And this is what the VHD is trying to do, only we're trying to do it for a developing system. So next. Okay, this scenario is not real. We cannot do this. I really want to let everyone know this is just our dream and we hope that someday that we can improve um, medicine and how we um, generate therapies, but uh, we're not there yet. So we can't really just call up a doctor, scan and have these treatments. But we, what we are doing, we are building um, the tools that can do this. Next. So this is the mission of the virtual human development. We're gonna try to make these this human development simulator, which is a simulator that can uh, try to replicate um, the, the human development steps so we can ask questions as scientists and understand what, um, what cells do and how we can use them to uh, help disease. Next. And the goal of this mission is to basically unlock all the rules. How are cells um, creating our body? How how uh, are they moving from, like, we start from a single zygote. How does a single zygote note how, when it's going to become a brain cell versus a heart cell? We're just starting to build all the little steps. And the more we unlock the rules of how development works, the more likely that we're going to be able to learn about um, how to treat diseases and hopefully in the future test regenerative therapies. Next. Okay. So why would we want to do this? Well, as scientists, we have uh, tools at our disposal. Right now, we have experimental tools. We can actually create little organs in a dish. They're called organoids. And we can try to uh, create little tiny hearts or lungs. However, once you're using human tissue, there are ethical boundaries, right? As scientists, we have to abide by ethical rules and we have to uh, follow proper protocols. So when it comes to human um, experiments, you cannot grow them longer than certain time points in it, in a dish or or in your in your lab. And so we cannot discover how do cells create these little um, these little embryos if we cannot grow them in a dish. What we can do is actually now what we're hoping to do is join experiments and theoretical systems to create um, more predictions so we can push past the ethical boundaries. So next. And though how we're gonna do this? Well, we're gonna do this as a team. 
one person cannot do this. And we have a great international team. And this team is composed of experts. Some can grow organoids in a dish. Others can coerce stem cells to do whatever they want to do. There's theoreticians that are mathematicians, physicists, engineers. And all of us are working together to combine what we know in terms of experiments, what we know in terms of theory. And we're going to use our knowledge and we're going to build this little simulator from our knowledge. And as we build knowledge, what we're going to do is identify what we don't know, because that's really what scientists want to do. We want to um, understand what is it that we don't know and fill the missing gaps. So we're going to use our bio engineering skills, simulation skills, their embryo skills and cells data to put it all together to create this little um, early developmental embryo. Next. So I hope uh, this is just gives you a little picture of what we're hoping to do. And it really takes a team and it's a team that's collaborating together. And together we're hoping um, to make a future that uh, is accessible through modeling and experiments. And thank you all for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Maria, that was that was fantastic. I, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to hear about different paths into learning, that we there's still a chance. I can still do science. I think that's, um, that's fantastic. And the way it just, I, I as always, Maria has, this, Maria has this amazing ability of making things sound very simple and sort of, you know, just, well, this is what we're doing. And then by the end of it, you're like, oh my God, we're creating virtual humans. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing your research. Thank you so much. You put, Maria's obviously put a lot of work into this. She's, she's uh, the, with the slides and the, and the, um, and the approach she's taken is just, is, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. That was fantastic. I'm blown away. Um, and now I think if we're, if we're good for, I, I believe, is James here? Um, I think we're good for James. Yes. Fantastic. Ah, oh, this is amazing. Um, so, so James, who has been traveling the world, has very kindly managed to uh, take a little pit stop and, and join us for this. Um, uh, let me introduce you to him. He is James Hobson, founder and CEO of Hacksmith Entertainment Limited. As you may already know, James runs one of the largest tech-based YouTube channels in the world called The Hacksmith, where they turn fictional ideas uh, from movies, comics, and video games into real-world prototypes. And it is a way, well, it's a way of inspiring youth around the world, also inspiring me. Uh, just absolutely brilliant channel. James, do you want to you want to jump in and uh, say hello and let us let us know about yourself? Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, it's awesome to be here and talk to uh, you guys about science and some of the stuff that we've been doing. Um, I think you hit most of the points on on what we do here. Um, really, we're trying to. Um, make science and engineering more accessible by combining it with pop culture. So taking some of these ideas from fiction, from movies, from comics, from video games, and asking the question, is this actually possible in real life? Could we use real technology in order to make something that was in fiction into a reality? So, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now you inspired to do some biology now as well? <laughs> yeah, we're doing some biology projects. Oh, great! I've had that. I look forward to that then. Well, thank <laughs> you so much. I know you are on a, you, you know, you are on a on a schedule, and I really, really appreciate you coming in to do this. This is fantastic. So let's get now that we've got James in the mix. Let's welcome back Derek and Maria, and um, and let's dive into some some Q and A, some questions. So over the next thirty five minutes or so, uh, it's your opportunity out there to ask your questions. Please continue submitting your questions throughout the Q and A uh, with the Q and A button our special button. And to make things more interesting, two questions I will pose today. This is another one of Conan's evil plans. Uh, we penned neither by myself nor our events team. They were submitted, in fact, by, well, we were submitted to uh, Generative AI to see what kind of questions would come up. And, uh, and Conan's come up with a couple of kind of fun ones for us. Uh, so uh, whenever you suspect a question to be AI generated, please uh, give us a thumbs up and uh, we'll test your ability to distinguish between AI and human writing. And uh, to kick things off, I'd like to ask our panelists a couple of questions that I came up with. So um, uh, the first one that, that, that leaps to mind uh, for me was there's a, we had a, when we first started talking uh, with Derek and, and, and Maria, we discovered that Maria was, was not a, was not a sci-fi fan, that, that Maria was not, you know, science fiction was not what led Maria to this. And I thought what was so wonderful about this is that Again, these different paths to learning. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know, um, uh, Derek. Was, was, was science fiction? Science fiction got you into it, and 
Maria, what got you into it? Let's start with, should we start with Derek to see um, what science fiction specifically got you into this? Um, I guess the major influences on me going into a, a career path that involved uh, looking at science fiction in an academic uh, setting were probably the traumatizing moment when I was a, a small child and my, my parents finally let me uh, watch uh, Jurassic Park. <laughs> um in the uh the mid 90s and i was um scared by that scene where um they find the uh the severed arm of samuel jackson's character and <laughs> told them i i needed them to turn it off right. um so that that was my my first exposure to the the wonderful world of genetic engineering and, and science fiction and then as a, a slightly older um child i found the movie gattaca which i mentioned in my, my presentation very um interesting and, and thought-provoking. That was another um, big contribution to me being uh, interested in the, the sort of overlap between um, science fiction and, uh, and um, my, my, by my background in having a biology degree. Thank you. Uh, Maria, you, had, you brought up a giant book the last time we talked about this and said that it wasn't science fiction, but this was the book that inspired you. What was what was your was your your introduction? What was your your that that you know that trigger for this stuff for you? Well, I mean, I didn't know I was going to be a scientist. Right. I, think I hope everybody can hear that. I really didn't know. I did um, fall in love in programming when I was really young, and I wanted to discover everything about it. And then somewhere in between, I thought I was going to be an engineer, and then I I realized that it wasn't. So, and I wanted to learn everything I can about biology. I just thought these cells were fascinating, but that wasn't early on. I didn't do this till I was like 18, 19. And then I took as many biology courses as I could. And I think that's where science started for me. Um, I think the true moment was uh, during my final year as an undergrad when I had to do a project and I had to actually do research. And that was the moment where it hit me. I love this. I love this <laughs> whole thing. <laughs> I wanted to do more. And I didn't even know that there was a master's or a PhD program at the time. Um, and then I pursued it. But uh, there was just that moment where I was like, oh, research, we can do this forever. And uh, <laughs> I want to do this forever. That's great. Um, so the research sucked you in. Now, what about now, James? What about it's I almost feel silly asking this question because you basically <laughs> every week show us what inspired you into this stuff. But but was there any specific one that got you? I mean, it's it's probably a pretty obvious one, but uh, <laughs> Iron Man one hit in movie theaters back in what two thousand eight. Mm -hmm. That was probably the first like, whoa, engineering is cool. And yeah. I think I think a lot of people had that reaction of like, oh wow, this is that that'd be really neat. And that kind of put me on the course of what about making inventions for myself instead of say just working for a company and whatnot. So yeah. <laughs> So, so Iron Man for sure. Yeah, there's definitely a there's definitely a Tony Stark thing happening there over at uh, Hacksmith Industries, isn't there? Um, all right, I've got another question for you here. Um, there we go. Uh, I've got one for another one for Maria. Maria, when you make math models of biology, what is the hardest part of that process for you? Um, probably translating biology into code. I think that's. Oh. How do you do that? I wouldn't even know how you'd start doing that. Um, really small steps. I, I think uh, one thing I was taught a long time ago, if you can say it, you can potentially program it. And so the first huh. thing I have to start saying it, writing it down, um, break it down into little tiny pieces. So if I want to understand why a cell moves from one place to another, I start break down, you know, what does a cell use to move? How does it move? Does it rotate? And you start uh, figuring out what are the little elements and then you translate them into code. Wow. Um, sometimes you don't know, and uh, you can use math and physics and lots of other fun things to capture some of the phenomena. And what, do you, what are you using for programming? What, what, is it different programming languages, or is there a specific one that's good for this? Or Over the years, it has changed. Currently, I use Mathematica. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Which is a nice yeah. language to start with, I think. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, and I've got one for Derek here as well. Thank you. Uh, Derek, what are the most important rules we need to follow when we use CRISPR to change human genes? Wow, just a simple question for you. There you go. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big one. There, there's a few, I guess, commonly mentioned um, rules of thumb that um, come up a lot in 
the the sort of academic literature on um, ethics and, and genome editing. Um, one of the the main ones that pretty much everyone uh, agrees on is that we have to be um, sure beyond a reasonable doubt that the technology has reached a point where it's safe and uh, we're not going to run the risk of creating too many unintended uh, mutations or um, causing the damage to the, the DNA um, in ways that we were unanticipated. Um, and of course, many people think that that's a reason to never use uh, genome editing in, in human embryos at all, um, because we have another technology um, that basically allows us to pick between embryos, ones that may not have the mutation that uh, we're trying to um, remove. So rather than going in and trying to, to fix a mutation, um, many people say that we should simply use um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to choose embryos that um, don't have the um, don't have the the mutation that we we would otherwise be using the the genome editing technology to um, correct. Mm -hmm. um, so the the safety and, and efficacy um, question is um, one that is is commonly talked about. Another one that is pretty important is the idea of uh, autonomy. Um, so in I guess layman's terms, that's basically the question of whether if we make a modification to a an embryo and it grows into a child, does that modification um, affect whether that person will have the same ability to choose their own um, life plan that other people mm -hmm. do? So for instance, you could say that if you try to modify an embryo to make your kid eight feet tall uh, so that they will have a great you know NBA career, mm -hmm. um, then that may be an advantage to them if they want to become a basketball player, but it might be, you know, a big difficulty if they want to become a, an astronaut or a race car driver, or any other, many other life paths. So oh, that's fascinating. Another, I thought of that. That's interesting. So another important thing to, to think about is um, whether the modification increases or reduces the, the freedom of the modified person to, mm. um, you know, pursue their, their own goals and not just those of their, their parents or the, the genetic designers or the government or whoever is uh, involved in choosing the, the modification. Oh my God, that's just that it opens up a whole world of stuff. The idea that you're choosing for your parent, you're choosing for your kid, what they're going to be just by the nature of the genetics you've given them. Wow. Um, boy, this is, this is a, this is a 10 hour symposium. That's what it should be. Uh, I got another question for you. Let's go this, let's put this one out to James here. James, um, you know, what would you say are the, the science fiction, you know, books, movies, whatever, whatever you prefer, that most accurately predicts the future to you? Like when you look at the, where we're going in the world, what do you, what do you see as the, as the most sort of accurate portrayal of where we're going? Uh, I love to bring it up whenever I can, but the, the Expanse series. Oh yeah. Uh, it's both a, a book series and Amazon Prime adapted it to a TV show where the writers were actually executive producers. So they did a mm. fantastic job on the show. Um, basically, it's a set a few hundred years in the future when we're more of a uh, a spacefaring civilization. There's colonies on Mars and the Outer Rim. Um, it's actually a bit of a, a geopolitical soap, space mm -hmm. soap mm -hmm. opera, you could say, because it covers a bit of everything about the potential politics that are going to happen once like the human race almost like divides a bit. Because the, the books even go into... The people who have now lived on Mars for centuries are genetically different than people yeah. who live on Earth. It's different gravity. The bo their bodies are different. Mm -hmm. Same with uh, the humans who are way out in the outer rim. They're tall, lanky. Their bones aren't very dense, and they couldn't even come back to Earth because their bodies physically wouldn't be able to uh, take the gravity. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like the book series and, and the TV show so much is the, the authors are actually very, very aware of real science and theories about how stuff like this is going to happen in the future. So even for like space travel, there's mm -hmm. movies like Star Wars and Star Trek that's just like, yeah, we hit warp speed. And it's like, <laughs> how do you accelerate a human to those speeds without them turning to mush? Right. Yeah. Um, the the books have very novel ideas of ways that this could be countered basically taking from like fighter jet pilots and like trying to equalize the pressure and all, all kinds of crazy stuff so 
if you're it is amazing how kind of a, a view of where we could be in a few hundred years i feel like it's one of the most potentially accurate pieces of fiction out there mm. and a lot of the technology is actually it already exists in some level it's maybe just not as advanced yet mm. Yeah, it's beautiful what they've done with that. They're and they they call themselves SA Corey, right? There's it's, they've changed. They use yeah, one it's name actually for two the authors yeah. writing under one pen name, yeah. and I think that's how they've managed to pump out like a book every year for the past like decade. Yeah, it's, I've <laughs> got to catch up on that because I've only read the first one now. But you know, um, anyway, Maria, do you have a do you have any any science fiction leap to mind that you that you've seen and gone like, wow, that's that seems I could see that happening. I mean, is that on your radar at all? Um, well, you already know that I'm not very good at the science fiction stuff, but but, but is there anything like question? Yeah. But uh, I mean, uh, I think most of the science fiction that I've been looking into because of you um, mm. are warnings that what mm. we could be and that whether we what we shouldn't be or what we might be heading. I don't know if I take them as our true reality, but if we keep going on this path, some of them serve us as a warning. Um, I think mm. I spoke to you about this movie, Her. Um, I, I was yeah. intrigued because, you know, this one person was obsessed by talking to an AI and mm. basically lived, I, I don't know the whole detail, but like basically lived with and basically that's all he talked to, to an mm. AI. Mm. And I, I think we're all stuck to our phones and that is very much almost a potential future that we might be, you know, chatting with an AI all the time because now they sound smart mm. <laughs> when you actually try to chat with one of them you know, they know a lot more information than we do and they can put it together and they sound like the person. Have you ever met someone who sounds really smart, but later, you you know, when you dig deeper and ask them a question, they don't know anything? Well, for me, me that's that GPT. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, so they have a lot of loads of information, but most of it is shallow. Um, but we might get sucked in thinking that they know more than they do. And, mm. um, and they might eventually in the future. But um, yeah, that's kind of the movie that kind of struck me. Yeah, you reminded me of that one earlier, and I it's I I forgot how prescient it was. I mean, that was literally ten years ago, a decade before we get into ChatGPT, and that film was already discussing the minutia of that stuff. Um, what about you, Derek? You get you do you have one in particular that you go, wow, that's that's it. In terms of uh, making accurate predictions, yeah, there there's one that um, is actually in a very similar vein to her, but for some reason doesn't get uh, talked about very much. Um, which I think about a lot when people talk about specific um, uses of um, chat GPT and, and similar models for um, sort of therapy, sort of, mm. um, because th th these sorts of things have increasingly been, been rolled out and, and tested sort of as a way of um, providing um, companionship or or responding to people who just feel like they need um, someone to talk to. And there's a movie from um, 2017, I think, um, which is called Marjorie Prime, um, which stars uh, John Hamm, but it's it's sort of a similar um, premise as as her, except it's a world where this artificial intelligence is being used um, to create a sort of artificial um, replica of this um, elderly woman with um, Alzheimer's um, to create a sort of a replica of her husband to provide. Um, companionship um, for her in her old age so it's an interesting um, it's an interesting way of sort of saying um, what if this technology was sort of being used you know not just for this um, you know Joaquin Phoenix type um, character in, in her mm. but how it might be sort of integrated into future um, medical care or um, you know integrated into the way that we try to provide more you know stimulation for um, you know the elderly because um, you know, increasingly, um, we're trying to we're trying to you know address the the problem of uh, old age and, and loneliness is one of the one mm. of the things that people have talked about a lot more, especially as the the population has has gotten older and the the, the boomers reach the age where they might uh, start to want a, a John Ham in their in their house. <laughs> Don't we all want a John Ham in our house? Come on, <laughs> there's a great right. Black Mirror episode. I yeah, of just that. <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing. Yeah, Black Mirror, actually, Maria, if you want to get into some science fiction in a little short form stuff, Black Mirror is fantastic for that. Mostly, mostly terrifying approaches to the future, but I, I, I usually recommend that one to people. To, it's a good starter science fiction to scare you. <laughs> um, Maria, actually, I've got another question for you here that's been submitted. Um, 
notice that the artwork in the slides was created by you. Uh, and it's amazing. As someone with a background in both science and art, how do you perceive the connection between science and science fiction in relation to your artistic abilities? Furthermore, could you elaborate on how your artistic pursuits have influenced or benefited your scientific career? It's a great question. Um, okay, there's two two parts to it. There's a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, I, I, I don't think a scientist means you do one thing. So please know that a scientist can and should probably pursue several things. Um, I think creativity is important for science. Um, without it, I don't think I can solve half the half of the problems that I've been facing. So I think you can use creativity to push you out of bounds. And I think that's part of the success, at least that I've seen for me. I, I love art. I love to paint. My kids paint. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know how to be anything else. I uh, learn better when I scribble. So I do not know how to take um, notes typing. I write. And if I don't write it, I don't know it. So I think I'm just, that's just kind of me. So I don't know how to separate science from art. And I don't know how to say, you know, one made it the other. I think they were both me. I became a scientist. And over the years, I built my art. Mm. Um, and I still do. Um, digital art is what you see me now do. I didn't know how to do that. It is another way of thinking. It's another way. Um, tablets are cool um, for that. You can make mistakes and undo them, which before that I couldn't do. Um, right. So um, it makes you push the limits, right? Um, mm. uh, art is not just drawing, right? So people use blogging and Insta and all sorts of other things too. So art comes with different forms and photography. So explore it. And I think it opens your mind to things. There was another part of that question. I don't remember. Um, yes. Oh, it's moved. Um, oh, there's I'm rapidly undoing it right now. I think, uh, I've, yeah, I'm sorry. It's been, it's been, uh, it's been moved. Oh, here's like, oh, here's like, uh, have I got it back? No. Um, here we go. Ah, uh, could you, th that's it. Could you elaborate? Thank you very much, uh, Conan, whoever did that. Um, can you elaborate on your artistic pursuits um, and on how they've influenced or benefited your scientific career? Has it helped you being able to do this stuff or having an interest in doing this kind of stuff, would you say? I think so. Yeah, I just yeah. kind of said that. I think creativity is really important. Art gives you a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I, I like to translate a lot of the talks into these little sketches. And I found I learn a lot right. more. And uh, so, yeah, of course, I think it helped, but it doesn't have to be art, right? So if you're into sports, you might find that useful. Um, I have to write things down in order to think, and that's my moment. So like when I never, I have to solve something, I'll take my pen and I just sketch or scribble. And mm. it doesn't look like anything normal for anybody, but it gives me my eureka moments. Mm. So I think art is my, you know, I guess the buttons that make my brain work. Mm. What about James? How do you do it? Do you when you when you come up with ideas and stuff? Are you are you sort of scribbling things down, or are you what's what's your method for getting your the things out of your head into the into the world? Um, I wouldn't say I'm much of a artist by uh, pen or paper. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more of my imagination and Metal basically and steel. making m making connections to existing technologies and things because. Mm -hmm a lot of the projects we do, it's not its not a brand new invention, it's just reimagining something in a different way um, to put a, put a more familiar spin on it for uh, pop culture and whatnot. So it's definitely very important. I feel like being creative is what leads to innovation and stuff like that. So um, like I call it like, steam not just stem because it's important to include the arts as well because yeah. without creativity where are we where are we going like it's mm -hmm. it's very important for culture and society and i think it plays a much bigger role than we might think with um invention and bringing new ideas to life mm -hmm. yeah it's true this, this is there, there used to be a very sort of pillared approach to this stuff and the fact that I mean, as Maria, as you're saying, by sort of combining those two and you doesn't, you know, you're not just an artist or just a scientist. And that was something that I only discovered later in my life. You know, as soon as you say, as soon as someone says like, oh, you know, oh, he acts, let's uh, off he goes, he'll just be in the arts then, you know, then I'm like, but, 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 but there's all this cool science stuff over there, you know? So now I'm hoping that we're, we're moving away from that. Um, Derek, got a question that's coming for you here. Is it possible to change human DNA 
with animal DNA? And what would be some of the side effects of splicing animal and human DNA? Wow. <laughs> you get the easy um, ones. <laughs> so um, in, in theory, yes, um, you could um, figure out what gene you wanted to introduce into a, a human embryo or a human patient from a um, animal origin and um, basically try to copy that into the, the DNA of a, a person. Um, there, of, of course, as we talked about a little bit during my, my presentation, um, you wouldn't be able to, to do that to an embryo in Canada, or you would um, be um, uh, contravening the, the law that we have here. Um, it's hard to say whether um, there would be any um, specific uh, health effects or, or risks, um, depending on the sort of um, gene that you were trying to introduce. Um, so, for example, one thing that is commonly done um, in science and also with um, in art, um, there are some artists who have introduced a, a gene called uh, GFP from jellyfish. That is a yeah. Yeah. gene that causes um, that causes the animal or the cells that have that gene to glow. And so scientists use that, um, but also some artists have tried making, um, there was a famous rabbit that an artist created that, that glows and also a, mm -hmm. um, a monkey that um, has this jellyfish gene to glow. Um, and as far as I'm aware, other than, than you know, glowing in the dark, these didn't have any um, inherent you know, health effects on the, these art projects. So in theory, if you were um, a mad scientist and going against the, the law in Canada, it seems likely that you could um, make a, a baby with this uh, GFP, you know, protein to to glow. So that's one example of a glow in the of, dark babies. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's that's a kind of gene that um, scientists have experimented a lot with moving between different animal species. Hmm. There's also the, the was it the, the chimeras or chimeras they talk about? Is that uh, Maria? You're nodding your head. You 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 know about these things? I'm assuming. <laughs> well, I mean, science. It's a tool. Hmm. So I'm not talking about putting animals into human embryos but you can use let's say you want to study human gene and we cannot i said there's limitations and ethical issues and um, that you cannot actually grow a human in a dish but you can actually take a gene that you want to study from a human and put it in a mouse cell or put mm -hmm. it in a mouse and that's what they call chimeras now you have a, a mixed um, system system that has mouse and human elements in it and um, they are important tools for us because without that we wouldn't know what the gene does um, mm. the other word that I'll use is uh, homologs so you can't just put any gene what homologs mean they're similar genes and we know that they kind of have similar um, properties and they'll do similar things and so we're not just swapping a gene you might but I think in, in mm -hmm. general you try to aim what is called the homolog you take a human homolog and you put it where the mouse would have been but you're putting it a human there and then you're trying to see if it's going to make the same thing mm -hmm. um, understand the, the human system so the Again, I would think of it more of as a tool. I don't know if it goes backwards. I don't. I don't think many people care to put a mouse in a human um, mm. system. I think it might be a sci-fi thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I meant that if our pursuit is try to understand disease and improve disease, what we're going to try to do is take something from a human because we cannot access due to these ethical limitations mm. um, and use our tools to to try to help. Mm. That's great. That's uh, thank you. Uh, James, got a question for you. You've worked on a variety of projects, just a few. Is there a particular project that holds a special place in your heart? <laughs> uh, I would probably say our Aliens Power Loader build, oh, yeah. um, because it was the most, I would say, accurate recreation of the future. Um, so Aliens is set in the year 2130 or something, about 100 years from now. And in it, there's this a uh, yellow mech suit that's kind of like a forklift, a walking forklift, and it's called a power loader. And the neat thing about the movie was uh, the fictional company um, that does all this research is called Wayland Utani Corp. Mm -hmm. But the the creatives behind the movie, um, possibly James Cameron, I'm not sure, decided that you know what would be more realistic? What if Wayland Utani Corp partnered with a real life company? Mm -hmm. So in the movie, it's actually Wayland Utani Corp and Caterpillar, the big yellow construction company. 
And we wanted to do this project because I, obviously with Iron Man and whatnot, exoskeletons and mech suits are a very, a very interesting field of engineering. And mm -hmm. we were able to recreate the power loader from aliens. And not only that, we actually partnered with Caterpillar, the real life company, and they actually sponsored the project and provided a Caterpillar skid steer base, which were used as the, the tank treads for the power loader and the main oh, hydraulic wow. unit. And we designed and built everything on top of it. So the arms, the upper body, all the controls and whatnot. So it's the most, it was like foretelling <laughs> the future, except instead of Utani Corp, it's Hacksmith Industries and Caterpillar. Yeah. So yeah. That's a pretty wow. cool one. It's, it's kind of rare that um, the science fiction authors put something that's actually like very possible. And it's just like, no, this could just be about the future. So yeah. that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, that was a neat, that was a very, very neat one. You So do you think, we're, are we going to see the, are we going to see Caterpillar loaders walking around? You know, is that in the future? Um, so that, that goes into an, an entirely different discussion, which is a interesting thing to think about. But if you want, ever wonder why things are the way they are, part of the reason is just because that was the standard that stuck. Mm. So, for example, forklifts use skids, and skids move everything. Mm. So a forklift is very good at picking up and manipulating a skid. A power mm. loader is not good at picking up a skid because it's designed for a forklift. Right. But this is the way things are. And this is the way things are continuing to be. So there's not going to be a change in how we carry stuff anytime soon. Same thing goes for shipping containers. They are a certain size, so they can be stacked on mm -hmm. shipping ships or on trains. And they might not actually be the best economical solution for moving stuff, but it's the way things are. Mm -hmm. So as the human race actually starts to go to space and maybe when we get to Mars or set up a moon base, there's a good chance we're going to take this legacy technology with us of, Oh, well, we'll just do it as a skid because that's how we do it on earth. Even though there might be a better solution. That's more, that's better for low gravity situations or more economical, more the right mm. shape. So it, it, it's really interesting. And you can start to see this in a lot of areas in the world, wherever, wherever something's become a standard, it's very hard to change that standard because that's the way it is. Hmm. So it's an interesting brain experiment to think, is there a better way? And are we not doing it because we're stuck in our old ways? Hmm. It's same with like electric cars. We had electric cars in the early 2000s. They didn't take off. We didn't have a charging infrastructure. Hmm. We're slowly starting to get a charging infrastructure. And now we're starting to get electric cars being like one third of cars, or I, I'm not sure what the, the actual number is. Um, the same thing could be said for hydrogen powered cars. Hmm. They had a hydrogen system in place. Maybe we can have better vehicles yeah. that are powered basically off of water. If you use renewable power to split water into hydrogen, now you're not using fossil fuels. Hmm. But we kind of get stuck as a society and, and world in these standards that this is how it is. So this is how we do it which is why we need out-of-the-box thinkers to think, is there a better way? Hmm. But even if you think of the better way, it's an uphill battle trying to move the needle and, and get society to, to work in that direction. So hmm. it's an interesting experiment to start thinking about these things of like, why is it like that? And hmm. you might learn that it's just, it's like that because that's the way it's been. Is Not that the same with genetics? Right. Sorry, sorry, Jane. Uh, is that the same with genetics? Do you find the same and and the sort of molecular biology type side of stuff? Are there are there are there sort of set ways of doing things that that may need to be looked at as well? COVID showed you this, right? mRNA, mm. yeah, and yeah, new ways of vaccinating. Yeah, that's a good point. So, sorry, would it's you could you for a while, uh, right? Mm. Could you um, could you expand on that a little bit for us, Maria? Just just to, just for people who may not know, who may not be so, virology, you know. Yeah, so I just meant like the, the mRNA technology and the vaccine capacity was around for many years. It's just mm. um, either pharmaceutical or some other blockage didn't allow it to move forward. And so it was kind of stuck in in, in, in just like trials or tests. Um, mm. 
I, I think uh, we hear about now the Nobel Prize winner, I think Kat Katarina. Um, right, she she won for designing the mRNA, but she did it back right. in 2011. Like if it was just sitting around. Um, the people who um, run Moderna and all that, they were waiting for this um, technology to be allowed to push forward to the next step because it mm -hmm. has a potential to cure other things other than COVID. And it was just sort of sitting around because status quo is, is easier, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is, I think I had that in my advice. It's not necessarily innovation. It's just sort of the way things are and we mm -hmm. kind of get stuck with them and you need that push to break through to the next um, step. And uh, COVID did it. It forced us to move from whatever was the status quo of vaccines to this new mRNA technology. And I'm not saying that mm -hmm. it was the best technology, it's just nobody would let it be applied or tested mm. or pushed through until we really needed it. Like it was just kind of stuck. And mm. now it might have the potential to help us a lot more than just with um, COVID, but we weren't allowed to try it until now. And people now accept it because they've now seen it in action. Yeah. Cause she fought, there was, there was quite a fight on that too, wasn't it? She was, there was a lot of, of, um, of uh, sort of so, institutional holding, Holding it yeah, back. no, you should read her story. She was actually fired. Yeah. Um, she was a professor and she was uh, fired from her post. I mean, she was put through wrong things. Mm. Um, I think if I recommend something, look at her Gardner Award. This is a Canadian award. Um, and I love her speech because in the end of it, she doesn't just thank all the people who stood by her, but she thanks all the people who tormented her and made her, um, mm. you know, suffer because she, she basically had to remove her post from being you know yeah. and uh and she had to start from scratch and she had to find a job and nobody believed in her and she was the only one who believed in herself mm. um, and uh, so she thanked her tormentors because she believes that it wasn't if it wasn't for them firing her she wouldn't have tried harder and she wouldn't have mm. you know created this solution but at the same time i don't think somebody should have gone through this kind of uh, torture in order for them to believe like we mm. should sort of have a better open ear for science but uh yeah she's definitely one of those stories of perseverance and grit and passion hmm it reminds me a bit um of uh i'm gonna pull this his name it was uh hey jean the, the 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 doctor who's responsible for doing that the the modifications i mean obviously a terrible mistake maybe not a terrible mistake, but a terrible response from to, to what he'd done but that also i'm guessing is what led to a lot of these these um these discussions that just wouldn't have happened had, had that not happened before. I'm not equating the two, but I, I guess the idea that the trouble can be a great, a great innovator. It forces it forces us to innovate and to and to consider things differently. That's 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 amazing. Um, all right, question. Oh, there's a question for me. Um, uh, could you talk about your work with Google on Goom on on GameFace? Um, in a nutshell, uh, this is a, a kind of a bit of a of a of a science fiction to, to science story. Uh, my friend Lance Carr. Um, who uh, who has a, um, a condition he he can't he can't move. He was complaining about the use of his eye uh, eye gaze technology to to control his computer, and we started chatting about it. And he said, "Well, surely AI can because you know AI can solve everything. Surely AI could be could be used to solve this." And I happened to be talking to a guy about at Google who was doing some AI stuff for us and um, uh, with us on on some Stargate stuff and. Uh, and we sort of ran it by him and he said, actually, you know, we've got this technology. And the next thing we know, you know, Lance is working with with Google engineers from all over the world. And they launched this thing called Google Game Face, which was basically an AI enhanced uh, eye tracking, face tracking software that allowed him to play video games in a much more intuitive way than 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 had been available before. Uh, not there yet. Like it's still, you know, it's that 80-20, that 20% makes a big difference. But that was just one of the wonderful sort of opportunities, again, that comes from my position is that you could sort of go like, oh, hey, there's someone over here, there's someone over here, and you could put them together and something wonderful happens. And and and, and Game Face was just was one of the uh, one of the responses from that. And Lance, is, I met Lance online because of it as well. It's fantastic, fantastic stuff. So but there's actually a, a really interesting accessibility technology that's being developed right now, very similar to that. Mm. Um, which we're going to be playing with quite soon. And it's all, it's. Oh, have we lost James? Imagine a retainer oh. that you put on the roof of your mouth for your mm. tongue. Because believe it or not, your tongue is the most dexterous part of your body. Mm. Which means if this hardware works, you could have more control, which is amazing for. Um, 
people with limited mobility to be able to do things literally by basically rubbing the roof of their mouth with their tongue. Mm. Like you could have more pinpoint accuracy than your hand with a mouse, mm. which means depending on the software and the, the things that are developed further with this, it actually enables up this entire new world of control. Hmm. Uh, another interesting way to look at it is like, you can use both your hands and you could also be manipulating something else. Right. Um, so we're, we're getting a sample of one of their products and I think they're actually available to the public right now. Oh, are they? Um, oh, cause Lance, I'm sure Lance would love that. I'll have to yeah, talk to, Lance to, to experiment with and we're, it's, uh, it's pretty fascinating. <laughs> well, if you need a hilarious guinea pig, Lance, Lance Carr is the guy is, <laughs> is your guy. He's, he's, he's wonderful. And he does a lot of, uh, of, um, uh, accessibility outreach and stuff as well. So, uh, that's amazing. I mean, that's actually, that's a perfect example of what we're talking about in a way where, you know, we, we've just assumed that the way we use computers is with this awkward keyboard and a mouse. That's just because it was developed by someone who had complete, you know, you know, so-called, you know, normal mobility and the mouse just happened to be a good way of doing stuff. We've, we've just, I mean, if we'd all started by using, you know, there's a wonderful technology called a quad stick, which is just a little tube that allows you to sip and puff and move stuff around on the computer. If, if we'd all grown up using those, we wouldn't have thought anything of it. And we'd have our hands free to do other things. I mean, it's not necessarily that that is the, this is the right way to use computers. It just happens to be because of a very narrow field of people, uh, usually old white guys, um, who, who came up with, um, with this technology in the first place. So that's, that's amazing. Um, uh, I can't wait to see that. When, when's that coming, James? When, when can we see that happening? Um, so I, I just sent them a 3D model of my mouth because they're custom made for you. Oh. And funny enough, last time I went to the dentist, they <laughs> 3D scanned my mouth to keep track of my teeth and cavities and whatnot. And I noticed there was a email scan button. So I, I asked the dentist nicely. I'm like, can you just type in my email right there? Yeah. yeah. So they actually sent me a 3D model and these are actually my teeth, which <laughs> oh my are God. 3D printed. And that's the roof of my mouth. So this company is actually going to be using that file to custom fit this retainer, essentially, to uh, my mouth. <laughs> that's great. And what about expense? I mean, because the other thing I find with accessibility stuff is that so much of this tech is because it's so niche and customizable, and, and, and the requirement for custom for customization is is so is so much that they tend to be very expensive. Is it is it particularly? I'm, I'm not too sure offhand, but mm -hmm. their their goal is definitely to bring this technology to as many people who, who need it as possible. And the beauty is most dentist offices now have these because it, it is a great way of keeping track of your, mm. your dental health over a period of time, which means it is as simple as going to the, like, it's not a, it's not like a custom yeah. technology is allowing us to do things remote, which is mm. amazing. So for example, mm. we did a project a few months ago where we connected a bionic hand company called psionic yeah. with a, another youtuber in the uk mm -hmm. and we were able to get him to have his arm 3d scanned which allowed us to make a perfectly fitting socket for him to then use the bionic hand mm -hmm. and we were able to do that without ever meeting him in person or doing oh. any measurements ourselves um oh, they wow. had a 3d scan there we got the file, we were able to 3D print a recreation of basically his arm and then create something that would fit onto that. And then when I flew over to London to give him the bionic hand, it fit perfectly. And it's, it's really amazing to show um, having this technology that's more accessible worldwide also means you don't have to go to the specialist place to actually be able to get something like, say, this, mm -hmm. um, whereas not so long ago, you would have like the only way you'd be able to get fitted for technology is to go to that company, mm. but that's not always possible. So it's, uh, it's really exciting that we're able to do stuff like this. Well, that's Maria. That's, I guess that's part of the virtual human thing too, isn't it? The idea that you don't, that you can actually be working on this stuff without actually having to have the actual person there to poke and prod and things. Yeah. That's the, the dream of the future, mm. right? It's me calling that doctor without Siri. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you might actually be uh, excited for a future project that I'm working on because after I got this, I was just like, what else could I 3D scan? So I have a 3D scan of my body, but not far enough for me. I'm actually going to be getting my body CT scanned. 
And oh, with nice. CT scan, I can actually get a 3D model of my entire skeleton. And our plan is to then 3D print my skeleton and to connect to pop culture for Deadpool 3, which features the return of Wolverine, oh. Hugh Jackman. I'm going to be able to 3D print my skeleton and then electroplate my skeleton like Wolverine and do that as a fun, like, showing what's possible. Obviously, wow. you can't do that to your real bones, but it'll be, it'll be really neat. And we will do a comparison. We're going to print my bones out of um, very similar material that has similar properties to bone. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to do a test and be like, how hard is a bone? Like, what can, how, how, how can I break my femur? And we'll actually have my femur and we'll be able to break it on something. Oh, and then wow. when we electroplate it out of metal, we'll see, okay, how much stronger is it now that we have a layer of metal coating the bone? So I'm personally excited for that because it just seems like a lot of fun. And it's a real cool intersection of a whole bunch of different uh, science and engineering and pop culture. <laughs> you got to put the teeth in it too. Definitely get those yeah. teeth in there, you know. <laughs> uh, all right, let's see what other questions we've got here. Um, oh, all right, Derek, question for you. I, I, I don't know why you keep getting the tough ones. How expensive is genome editing? <laughs> oh, geez. Um, it depends a lot on um, what you're trying to do. It's mm. CRISPR, one of the main advantages of it compared to the technologies that existed before that were, you know, were also genome editing technologies mm. um, is mainly that um, even if it's not necessarily more um, more accurate or, and precise. Uh, one of the big benefits of it was that it, it's a lot um, cheaper and a lot faster and a lot easier to um, to teach a young um, graduate student or, or postdoc to um, implement and, and use compared to the the technologies that existed before. Hmm. Um, so it's it's represented a, a real big um, come down in terms of. Uh, in terms of price compared to the technologies that, that previously existed to, to do um, similar things. Um, if the question is relating more to potentially using it in, um, in human embryos, um, even though that's not um, allowed in, in Canada, we can actually compare it to the, the services that currently exist that um, let parents uh, pick between, um, between embryos on the basis of um, different um, predicted traits. So there's a few companies in uh, the U.S. and China and Brazil that basically will um, use a genetic test um, and then compare the the data from your potential children's uh, genomes to make estimates like, oh, this one is going to have a, a lower chance of diabetes, of uh, coronary disease, of um, different uh, different medical conditions. Um, and those currently in the U.S. go for, I, I think, about a thousand U.S. U.S. dollars, but wow. they're they're part of a uh, an IVF um, cycle, which is considerably more expensive. So it's an it's an add on to uh, to uh, a um, an existing treatment uh, exactly. product that is uh, considerably more more expensive to begin with on the scale of uh, ten, mm. tens of thousands. Yeah, I mean, speaking to that, the, the genome editing stuff as well as the there's a I've got uh, my friends at the at the Odin have a bunch of these kits where where you know you can you can basically start out with with this with this you talking about the the um, uh, the GF proteins as well you can they have they have kits for all that kind of stuff so they just it's definitely becoming something that in the same way that we had electronics kits as kids I think we're beginning. We're beginning to get to the point where we're getting these sort of like these biology genetics kits as well that's that's possible as well again not working with humans but 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 sort of the opportunity is is fa it's fairly cheap it's not doesn't seem crazy expensive um uh, all right thank you uh questions what else we have here uh for well i want to do some for anyone ones ah here we go i knew it was coming at some point what are your thoughts on ai and have any of you used it to help with research maria you're already smiling so i'm asking you first <laughs> No, I haven't used it to help me with research. At all, nothing. I mean, if you were to use it for something, I would say let it help you with your grammar and your writing. I don't right. know if I trust it for anything else. Um, my thoughts on AI, I think it's fun right now. It's interesting what it can do, like in terms of, and, and what we're talking about is the AI, the AI that's working with more like words, tech. There's mm -hmm. a, this is, 
language AI. Of course, there's a lot of possibilities what AI can be, but here where you're where you're talking about like the chat GPT, it's language. So it's it has right now been trained on so much language, so much words, so much, and it has access to data and it's spitting back data at you. Right now it's just spitting it back at you in a smart way and they're gonna improve it. What are we at version four? Mm -hmm. um, and I do remember like somebody um asked me about a program and I said, I don't think it's possible to write it that way. And then they went and asked Jad GPT and sent it to me and they said, look, but this one told me you could. Oh no. To be honest, it was garbage. It, it had the mm. potential, but it's garbage. So it, like superficially it has power. And I think uh, it, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have potential to mm. use it. And I think it could improve what we do, especially things that are repetitive and things that we don't need to. I'd love a chat GPT that could help me edit my work. Mm. Um, because, you know, I have books that I'm learning, you know, what's the best way to edit my writing? Scientists have to write if people um, don't realize that we, we don't just have to like do the work. We have to eventually distill it into written. And that's the hardest part right? mm. to, be able to take all your ideas and write it out. And um, so my my favorite part would be to use such as AI to improve uh, my writing skills. But um, no, I haven't used it, to be honest. All right. All right. We'll see what we'll talk about. It. We'll talk about it. See what happens in a few years' time. I've been told I got to wrap it up. I, I'm, which I can't believe we've just got through. So, uh, yeah, this has just been fantastic. All right. Let me see. Oh, I'm even supposed to say here. What an incredible discussion we've had. What an incredible discussion we've had. Uh, that was just fantastic. Thank you all, Derek, Maria, James, for for dropping in from your from your travels. A huge thank you for being here, uh, for sharing all of your experience and experiences with us. Um, and uh, can we all please show them a, a, a our appreciation with a round of virtual applause? Is there an applause button? That's that's what I need. Um, we've got our closing slide. That's it. That's a little hand. There you go. Thank you all so so much. So to wrap up, I want to reflect on one question: Which field of technological innovation are you most excited about? This is our last poll, I believe, of the uh, of the of the of the day. Um, you don't have to limit yourself to the options that are here. You can get creative, share your responses with us in the Q&A box as well, if you'd like. And let's have a look at those results. But I also want to say thank you. This has been fun. You made it really oh, you know, good. lovely. So thank you for yeah. hosting us and uh, leading the way. It has been uh, my, Thank you so much. My pleasure. The, sci the, the Let's Talk Science folks, people have made it incredibly easy and a huge shout out to, to Conan as well for, for making all, putting this all together. Thank you, Maria. That's, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, oh, well, we got, some, we got some stats. Okay, 20% say environmental sustainability is the innovation they're most excited about. 40% says health and bio. Here you go, healthcare and biotechnology. Here we go. Uh, no one's interested in information and communication technology. If I could vote, I would have put that in there. Uh, robotics and manufacturing, 30%. And uh, no one for transportation or space exploration? Seriously? And then others. <laughs> a lot of others as well. I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to sway the poll at all. This is why I'm not a scientist. Um, but uh, so there you go. We got, we basically, I guess it's about evened up now. There you go. That's it. I've got my thanks for participating. So I guess we're good. Um, Okay, what have we got here? Uh, our next Visionary Symposium will be happening May the 9th. And if you haven't registered yet, you may visit our event page by clicking on the link in the chat box. Please do so. Um, and I'm going to, what am I going to do here? There we go. Finally, I've got, so I'm just checking my instructions here. Uh, so make sure you register here for Let's Talk, Let's Talk Forests. Uh, I'm not going to read out the URL, but, uh, but that is coming up. And finally, thank you everyone for joining us for your virtual applauses and your clicking of buttons and your polling of polls uh, for joining us on our symposium today. I want to do a big shout out again to the organizations that made this possible. Thank you to our event partners, ArcticNet, the Canadian Space Agency, yay, Genome Canada, woohoo, let's talk science, ah! the Royal Society of Canada, yay, and the Stem Cell Network, which I was looking at the other day, for putting this event uh, together for us today. Um, the event was generously supported by the Let's Talk Science visionary donors. I got to start adding visionary to myself as well. Uh, thanks again to everyone, our panelists, our participants, the events team, everyone. Thank you all so much, Maxine, for handling all of our uh, all of the of the uh, of the screens that uh, that popped up for us. Everyone, goodbye. Thank you very much. Be brave. Be kind. Be brilliant. We'll see you soon. Cheers.